Tech Triathlon Show 269. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode I interview Aitor Virbay Morales. Aitor is a performance nutritionist at the Astana Pro Team, which is a world tour level cycling team with a background in science and academia. In this interview, we discuss uh, in particular a study that he conducted in mountain marathon runners and their intake of carbohydrate during a racing scenario where they went really high, up to 120 grams of carbohydrate per hour and investigated the effects that that kind of strategy might have. But before we dive into that interview, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. As we are in the middle of winter training here in the Northern Hemisphere at least, and uh, at least in Portugal we are having a bit of a, a cold shock right now, a lot of us are probably stuck on indoor trainers and doing a lot of indoor training, which typically means a lot of sweating, more so than normal. And it's important to be aware of the fact that when we sweat, we lose sodium through that sweat, and depending on how much your sodium concentration level is in your sweat, you might be losing a really large quantity and need to replace that to maintain performance in your workouts and not run the risk of suffering from things like cramps and nausea and so on. And the longer your training, the more intense the training becomes and so on, the more important and crucial this becomes. Also, if you are somebody training at a higher volume and you need to recover for a second workout in the same day, then that also applies. You need to be more and more particular with understanding your sodium losses and your sodium intake to compensate for those losses. Precision hydration helps you do that because you can get a sodium supplement that, or an electrolyte supplement that matches how much sodium you lose in your sweat. So if you lose a lot, then you can get a strong concentrated supplement and vice versa. And you can take a free online sweat test on Precision Hydration's website and that will give you a really good ballpark estimate for how much sodium you lose and inform your purchasing decision as for which level of concentration that you should go for. Check it out on precisionhydration.com, take that free online sweat test and get 15% off your order with the promo code DEATTRIATHLONSHOW15. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. As you know, Roka is not just a triathlon brand, but they also make some of the best eyewear on the planet with ultra lightweight frames, adjustable features on those frames, so you can just bend them to fit your face profile. They never slip thanks to the Kiko anti-slip technology. On their website, they have things like virtual try-on options and an online vision test so you can update your prescription in just 15 minutes. They also have home try-on options so you can try up to four pairs at home for seven days and send back the pairs that you don't want or all of them. And they have blue light blocking lenses to help you block out that blue light, which especially later in the, in the evening is really important to not compromise sleep quality. Prescription glasses are only available in the United States, but for people elsewhere, Roka have a fantastic lineup of non-prescription sunglasses from casual day-to-day wear to performance. My favorites in those categories are the Matador for training and racing and the Aviators for day-to-day wear, even though I also use the Matador a lot for that particular uh, scenario. Also, in terms of the prescription glasses, uh, I was lucky enough to be sent a pair, despite not living in the US, and I love the Rory sunglasses. They are really, really uh, stylish, and uh, yeah, they have all of those features that I mentioned above. So if you are somebody who wears sunglasses, or just sunglasses, which we all do, thanks to our sport, check out the options that Roka have to offer, and get 20% off with the discount code that you can get on roka.com forward slash TTS. Now, without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Aitor Virbay Morales. Welcome to that triathlon show, Aitor. How are you doing this morning? Thanks, Michael. Uh, I'm fine. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you, and thanks for your invitation to the podcast. Yeah, uh, no, no problem. There were a lot of 
people that I have interviewed before that actually recommended you uh, because of based on your the research that you've been doing, which is really interesting and I will talk about in just a moment. But before we get into that, can you just introduce yourself a little bit more? Uh, who are you and uh, what do you work with and, and so on? Okay, so yeah, thank, thanks again because for me it's, uh, it's quite exciting to be here, eh? taking into account how uh, the big names that uh, you had in this podcast, so uh, quite blessed, blessed for me here. Okay, I'm uh, Aitor, I'm uh, a young, interested in physiology, in metabolism, in exercise, in everything about sport performance. Uh, I am a sport performance nutritionist, but uh, yeah, I'm more especially interested in in understanding physiology and metabolism. Nowadays, I am working with professional cyclists, um, with pro teams and world tour riders, and I do research um, as far as I can. I'm starting now my career or researching career with uh, my um PhD also, and uh, in, when, when I have time, I am also a, a professor in some postgraduates and master and some universities like here in the in the past country. And I think that's all. I was a um, cyclist, elite cyclist, some years ago. So uh, I am always, um, I'm, yeah, I'm in love with the sport, with trying to be out in nature and uh, testing everything. So that's a quite important point i think for understanding our our work of nutrition or physiology in in, in the exercise yeah yeah good and and just one follow-up on that which uh, world tour teams uh, is it that you're working with yeah i'm working nowadays with a french team that is called nipo delco one province uh it's a pro team in the second category of, of the cycling um the cycling world and yeah, we are doing some great work there. Um, and apart from from here, I'm working with some other uh, individual riders in the in the World Tour teams, and just um, improving or trying to improve their their performance uh, with with nutrition. Yeah. All right. So let's get into the, the studies that you conducted, uh, in particular uh, the ones that that have raised a lot of interest. Understandably so, is the the studies uh, based on the mountain marathon and the different levels of carbohydrate ingestion. So you compared different amounts of uh, carbohydrate usage uh, in elite runners. There, can you uh, explain a bit more what the study was about and what the the hypothesis you wanted to test was? And and uh, and then I'll ask follow up questions as needed. But you can just take the reins and, and describe that study in a bit more detail. Yeah. Okay, I think that describing a whole research is quite difficult because uh, you know that the the long from uh, when you start to think about it uh, until you write and publish the the paper is quite long. But uh, I think we can start saying that uh, we were testing different carbohydrate intakes during the, the trial running, and, and we we were seeing that. Um, the ones who consume higher amounts of, co- of carbohydrates, they had better recovery. They had uh, lower metabolic um, stress, and we were measuring this uh, with our our athletes, with our, with our individual um, athletes. And finally, we we came to an idea that we could prove or try to prove this in a scientific um, or in a research. In a, good research a good uh design research and finally we did uh we did it uh, it was a really really hard process but uh what we did is to uh do a design based on three groups the um, the first one it was the low group that uh was the the lower uh, range of carbohydrates uh, requirements or um um no requirements but uh the um, what what athletes usually eat on the on the trail uh, on the trail marathons or ultra marathon and um, the second group was the, the control group what we call the control group that was ninety grams per hour and it was the um, the up limit of the current recommendations nowadays 
And the third group that uh, we call them, what call it the experimental group, uh, was the, the ambitious strategy that uh, it was eating 120 grams per hour. That it's, it was quite a lot, but it was what what we are uh, we were doing and trying to to prove that uh, it was not only possible but uh, beneficial. So uh, what we did uh, was to based on these three groups. Uh, during a mountain marathon, we measure uh, previous uh, the marathon and after that um, some metabolic uh, parameters, uh, biochemical parameters in, in blood tests and some uh, physical tests like neuromuscular function or uh, glycolytic capacity. And I think that, yeah, in conclusion, we, we did uh, this um, and we... Um, yeah, we came to big results that um, they were exciting and really interesting for us and um, impressive also because um, I think it can open uh, a new door in the in the sport nutrition topic. So if you go into the, the findings and the results a little bit, you first of all, you measure, measured uh, markers of uh, muscle damage uh, and uh, you found that the the high carbohydrate group 220 uh, gram had uh, much better markers compared to the other groups, at least in, in some of the markers, the creatine kinase and lactate dehydrogenase and maybe some other marker that I'm forgetting. And also you measured how quickly the neuromuscular and uh, glycolytic functions were recovered after the race. So basically how how long is it until you can, you can really train at a good uh, good high intensity both in terms of the, the glycolytic system and the neuromuscular system again and again you found that based on the test you were doing which included things like counter movement jumps and uh, uh was it win wing gate or 30 second uh no three minutes i think it yeah. was a, yeah three, 20 kilometer per hour uh, treadmill time to exhaustion test essentially so a two or three minute test you found again that the 120 gram per hour uh, group of runners had recovered better uh at the time point after the race where you tested. So can you go into the details of that? Because that, that was just my high level summary from memory, but uh, yeah. obviously you, you, you are you more well explained this than me. better than me. Huh? <laughs> it's good. <laughs> and any, anything, anything that I missed there though, <laughs> any, anything you want to, or elaborate on what, what, what does it, what are the, basically what the, the, do those results mean really in practice? Yeah. Um, I said that it was impressive for us because um, uh, we we understood that after after these results that uh, we were doing a new method for recovering for optimizing recovering during the exercise and the important results came with uh, the second paper that, about neuro uh, muscular function and aerobic uh, sorry glycolytic capacity so this was a clear um, test to prove that the recovery was better 24 hours uh, post marathon and you know this this was really really interesting for us a new opportunity or new possibilities in the in the nutrition or sport nutrition but i think that uh, one topic that was a little bit um, forget in uh, in this paper was the the capacity to train the gut and the, the capacity to tolerate higher carbohydrate amounts um, than what recommended nowadays or currently. And this is a quite important result for us, although it was not the, the main topic of the research, but uh, because we, we showed that uh, it was possible to, to ingest uh, such a big amounts of carbohydrates and not only that, but for uh, training without... Uh, gastrointestinal problems and um, yeah, tolerate higher uh, amounts of carbohydrates than uh, what is currently recommending that. I think that this, this is the, the true big possibility here in these two, in these two papers. Yeah. So, so to recap for listeners that may not be aware, typically in the last a few years 10 years or so maybe uh, we have heard that 90 grams per hour of carbohydrate is the maximum limit that you can actually absorb carbohydrates at so the recommendation has been that for for longer races uh, like for 
uh, an Ironman or for a cycling stage race or whatever, 90 grams per hour is what you should be taking in because you will benefit from uh, from that much carbohydrate. But but going higher probably isn't beneficial because you won't be absorbing. But what uh, but what you have found here is that well, at, at least it is tolerable, which is uh, a great finding in itself. Uh, so and and obviously for a stage race in particular where the amounts of energy burned over the course of those three weeks will be massive this is something that is very intuitive to to see that it will be beneficial to to get in more uh, carbohydrates if that means even just if it doesn't mean performance on the day itself but just recovering better for the next day but even i think in a in, in something like an iron man a one day race but where the energy demands are pretty massive and uh, especially for depending on the athlete and their metabolic and physiological profile i think that the ability to go above 90 grams per hour can potentially be uh, a game changer in terms of or it can be like the difference between between getting on a podium at a race and and not doing it or winning a race and getting second so i agree that that's an important finding so can you talk a little bit about what sort of gut training protocol the runners had gone through to be able to to tolerate that amount of carbohydrate yeah um yeah it is important what you what you have said that um you know the current recommendation on on the science on the literature is up to 90 grams per hour but this is not um the this is not the what we are what we are seeing on the reality with with athletes that they are consuming higher carbohydrates and uh, we don't know if, if uh, with benefits or not but they are doing them and the riders uh, the cyclists with uh, higher carbohydrate amounts of uh, during the races sorry they are um, doing bigger results and we are seeing also in the marathon on Ironmans or other endurance extreme events uh, so yeah I think this uh, um, a new open door for, for the sport nutrition yeah so uh, it's obvious that for assuming tolerating this uh, high um, grams of carbohydrates is quite important it's almost uh, mandatory to train the gut and train the gut is not to i don't know to put weight on your on your <laughs> gut and uh, start doing <laughs> exercises no it's just to uh, to tolerate higher amounts of fluids and foods during the exercise uh, it is quite important this because uh, during exercise you know that the um, the blood fluid is uh, reorganized in the in the body and it is a restriction in the in the digestive organs so it's quite important to train this this capacity to tolerate uh, fluids and foods not only in the in the stomach but also in the um, intestine to increase the absorption of uh, carbohydrates on the uh, yeah, monosaccharides so um this is quite uh, an important topic that we are working on it, uh, I think, like four years ago. And we are trying to develop new new methods of training the gut because uh, we are seeing that this is so important, not only on performance, but only on, uh, also sorry, in the recovery and in the um, um, food behavior with, with athletes. So in this research, uh, we did not a uh, systematic training the gut methodology but it was a inclusive criteria to to carry it out some uh, training session with high carbohydrates amount more than 90 grams per hour during four weeks and uh, two sessions per week so uh, we ensured like this that uh, they they were able to tolerate higher amounts of carbohydrates higher than 90 grams per hour and to be honest it was a little bit impressive to 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 receive or to see these results of um, that the, that they tolerate um, well these these amounts. So uh, it was not a systematic or I don't know in uh, an, uh, important or I don't know how to say, but it was not a a, a methodology or a training the gut uh, yeah method a structural method, but it was an uh, inclusion criteria to. Uh, train uh, the four weeks prior to the to the event uh, to at least two days per week uh, higher amounts of uh, carbohydrate than 90 grams per hour it gives an indication at least that that if you do that if you train two days per week with with a high amount of carbohydrates 
nine grams or higher than uh, for four weeks then on on average it seems that well the study participants at least seem to adapt to that and then be able to tolerate 120 grams on race day so so it's a good starting point i think for for practical application when it comes to training Mm -hmm. training the gut even though it wasn't systematic as you say yeah Uh, when you when when you measure the the tolerance to uh, the carbohydrate and compare it between groups how did you do that was it uh, a qualitative like a questionnaire type uh, comparison or what, what were the actual outcome measures when it comes to to the tolerance of the nutrition protocol and and the differences between groups were non-existent or can you elaborate on that a little bit yeah i think that this nowadays uh, we haven't got any other um, method to measure the tolerance than uh, individual questionnaire or uh, yeah this kind of a list where you can do punctuation of your uh, tolerance in some items. So uh, you, you can do like this, or, or even if you cannot run, this is a, a logic and clear um, result that you are not tolerating well. So uh, here in our research, we had some uh, riders who, so runners, sorry, that um, they didn't finish the, the race due to gastrointestinal problems. But uh, I can't. I cannot remember now exactly uh, how how many they were. But uh, they were only like maybe five or six out of twenty or twenty two or twenty three. So it was a quite um, successful. Uh, and were, were they were they from from spread fairly equally across the different groups, or was there a trend there that the the ones that did not that had gastrointestinal issues and didn't finish the race because that could be a confounding variable if they were not included in the analysis of tolerance no uh, initially they were uh, in total i think 26 or 27 athletes i I cannot remember well now but uh, i think that uh, six athletes withdrew and in the in the first paper we have a a table where we explain there uh, in each group which uh, how many riders they run a sorry they uh, withdrew from the from the race but of course it was related with the higher carbohydrates amounts uh, there were some uh, gastrointestinal discomfort flatulence or refluxes or whatever and there were i think some others with injury you know that in in in, in the mountains the injury is a <laughs> typical um yeah, typical question of withdrawal, and uh, it was part of the research as well. Yeah, uh, I'm just looking at the the research paper now, and uh, I'm going to try to to go to the research the, the results section here if I can find it. Uh, here, here we go. No, I can't find it immediately. Anyway, I'll find it uh, a bit later. I'll. Uh, yeah, I have to... here. You can see here. I will. I will tell you. Yeah, in the first group, uh, two were excluded due to the injury in the low group. I mean, sixty grams per hour. Yeah. In the second group, the control group, the uh, group in the middle, uh, they uh, were two uh, runners excluded, one due to injury, and the 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 remaining with concentration uh, problem. And in the higher group, the one hundred twenty grams per hour. And the both excluded were due to the gastrointestinal problem. That is what's logical because it's quite a big amount okay. and it's a lot of okay. food. So that's yeah. what the, uh, sorry because I didn't have the, here the, the table, but uh, now I can, I can see. Yeah. yeah. Now, now I see the same table as well. So, so you didn't uh, necessarily find that it's equally tolerable. It's more, it's more difficult to tolerate uh, that at least based on the the dropout rates, even though it's not a, you don't have a statistical analysis of that, of course, with that small sample, but, uh, but just intuitively it looks like it. But then again, you have uh, a large amount of uh, athletes. You have, well, uh, not large, but you have six athletes in the low group in the 60 grams per hour, seven athletes in the control group in the 90 grams per hour and seven in the high carbohydrate group that finished the race and uh so so you have an, an equal amount of athletes in uh, fairly equal amount in each group that finishes and and if you can get uh, that like a reasonable percentage of athletes to finish that with <laughs> yeah. uh w- with, without experience the, the gi issues maybe it just goes to show that 
for mo- for many athletes, 120 grams per hour is tolerable. And for the others, who knows, maybe they would have needed to train a little bit more or maybe for them as individuals, it might not be achievable and they might shoot for something a bit less. But but either way, yeah, I guess, you, I guess the, po- the, point find... that, the point I'm trying to make is that for, for a lot of athletes, it is possible to, yeah. to achieve to- to- the tolerance to 120 grams per hour. Yeah, and you can find interesting research about this. I think the... Uh, Costa from Australia, I think he's from Australia. Uh, he and his group, he ha- they have uh, a big research about training the gut, uh, about proving that um, training with carbohydrates can uh, increase the tolerability or tolerance, sorry, to to carbohydrate intake. And this is the this was the like our um, starting point to prove also this uh, this thing in in, in the research. Yeah. Yeah. So with the 90 gram recommendation that we currently have from research, the the rationale behind that uh, seems to be that uh, we think that you can absorb about 60 grams per hour of glucose and 30 grams per hour of fructose based on the just the saturation of the different transporters or different types of carbohydrate. What would you think, what are the potential mechanisms behind using 120 grams per hour if we if you actually see in the real world and in studies like this that it it is possible and it can be beneficial what what would you think might be the the mechanisms behind that yeah that's a really interesting question and it's in fact what we are asking ourselves almost every day i think uh, because um i will be honest here uh, i don't know the um, the mechanisms under this, uh, but it's quite obvious that they can tolerate higher carbohydrate amounts than 90 grams per hour. And so our work now is to understand these mechanisms. So uh, we know well that um, 60 grams per hour could be absorbed uh, through one transporting and um, of glucose, sorry, and the other one with uh, fructose up to 30 grams per hour and that's the what is now in the literature and well accepted but uh, I think that there are or there could be some other mechanisms under this and one could be a higher uh, ability to absorb glucose and when there are some research about this that uh, when a higher concentration of glucose um when there are high concentrations in the lumen, there is the GLUT2 transported can help or could help uh, in this absorption. So it could be higher than 60 grams per hour or 1 gram per minute. And the other uh, line is the fructose. I think that uh, we can improve a lot the knowledge about the fructose. And we are seeing that uh, for reaching high carbohydrate. Uh, quantities um, fructose probably will be the the key uh, nutrient or the key uh, sugar and I think that there are some interesting research done in in animals that uh, the the fructose can be I will say trained or this trainability of the uh, fructose absorption is um, bigger or greater than what we currently know or what we think. So I have like two, these two lines that uh, one is the uh, about glucose that we can absorb higher uh, quantities of glucose per hour or per minute. And the second line is the, the possibilities with fructose. And we are seeing this with uh, other researches done by uh, Roland, I think, and, and, his group uh, with higher uh, quantities of fructose and the, the tolerance was mm, better and the oxidation rates also were, were uh, higher. So um, honestly, I, I don't know exactly <laughs> how to uh, answer to this question, but, but uh, yeah, I think that there are some possibilities in both glucose and fructose, but especially in the, in the latest yeah so so are you are you and potentially other research groups currently looking into that uh, the mechanisms behind it or do you actively have some research going on uh yeah to be honest uh, our resources here in uh, in the Basque country they are not 
big to to uh, such ambitious projects. But yeah, in the way we can, we are trying to research also this um, ratio, this famous ratio of glucose and fructose and its effects on not only on the tolerance, but the oxidation and, and some other outcomes. Yeah. Mm. And I don't know if this is uh, something that is just anecdote or if there is any evidence behind it, but uh, I've seem to have heard that uh, fructose is more often related to uh, potential gut issues, GI issues during exercise and, and racing. So maybe this, uh, that fructose being the one uh, carbohydrate that has the big potential for trainability in terms of increasing the, the intake, that just also imposes demands on like actually training the tolerance. You're not just training the, the intake ability, but also the tolerance. Because, uh, because from what I understand, at least fructose might be the one that is more closely related to, to GI issues than, than glucose. Is, is that something that you and can comment on yeah but this is um why it's important to train the gut and to get used to use fructose uh and i know that fructose is related to the gastrointestinal problems and uh, a lot of research about this but um we are seeing now every day that that sorry that they are uh, taking a lot of fructose and they are improving uh, I mean, the athletes, our athletes, they are improving uh, the tolerance to the, those quantities of fructose. So uh, I am a little bit, um, I don't know how to say, but I, I see a lot of possibilities on the fructose. And uh, I think that even the, one of the most important or most uh, known brand in nutrition, they are using higher uh, quantities of fructose. And I think this is this could be one future line in in this top yeah mm. and and uh, a follow-up on that again so in the study what was the ratio of glucose to fructose that uh, the athletes used and uh, also when you're working with athletes in the, the pro cyclists uh, that, that are using a high amount of carbohydrate uh, what, what would your recommended ratio for them be yeah in the research it was uh two Point uh, one. I mean the the, the usual uh, ratio, what is well studied yep. in, in the in the literature. So uh, we use that ratio, uh, but I this um, opinion, personal opinion. I think that probably in the in the high in the X group, in the experimental group, the higher one, uh, with um, different ratio, it will be. Uh, better it would be uh, lower gut intestinal uh, problems and related what your second question what we are doing nowadays in the professional cycling uh, i think that up to 90 grams per hour the the best ratio could be 2.1 and it's well understand understood sorry but uh, when you when you are looking for going to extra details extra quantities above 100 grams per hour i think you should uh, you have to uh, increase the, the the quantity of fructose so maybe a ratio of uh, 1.0.8 or 1.1 could be better than 2.1 mm, all right yeah so just uh, to to give an example for the two to one ratio uh, for, for listeners is for 90 grams that would be 60 grams of glucose and 30 grams of uh, of fructose for for two to one ratio but that then potentially uh, would change for uh, for that higher amount of total intake and and the brand that you said that is using a higher amount of fru fructose which brand is that uh yeah i think it's mountain i don't know how do you pronounce oh, yeah. in english mountain but yep. yeah it's yep. uh I think they are using one and um, one of glucose and zero point eight of fructose, and I think okay. it's quite. Uh, there are some research about this, and it's quite. It has a lot of possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the study, when you, when you found the uh, the faster recovery and lesser muscle damage in the in the high carbohydrate group, do you think that in terms of like so this was. A race and perhaps in a racing season if the athletes have another race in two weeks or one week or well in cycling the next day in a stage race 
obviously recovery is super important but if we're talking about for example just a big training day do you think that sometimes maybe it would be more beneficial in terms of training adaptations to actually let that damage happen and take the increased recovery time by maybe not maximizing the carbohydrate intake essentially are you blunting the adaptive signal if you're uh, if you're really really minimizing the damage and the recovery time by taking a re- in a really high amount of carbohydrates hmm. yeah mm. Well, quite, I, I know this is quite not, a good question. This, this is not something that you research, obviously. Yeah, so no, more, no, no. We're going into discussion. <laughs> yeah, but this is something that we have uh, on the mind, of course. Uh, uh, this one, my opinion about training and performing is that um, I told every every I tell sorry to every cyclist I work with that um, being a professional cyclist, for example, is not to perform one day only as best as you can, but to be every day uh, the best you can be and to try to perform as uh, as best you can every day. So recovering this process is essential. But of course, we know that um, there are some, you know, there is some stress in the cell that is important to um, to produce these training adaptations. Uh, and we are talking about so many things that happen in the in the cell, not only the muscle damage but uh, the the ROS or metabolic or well, some uh, mechanism but the muscle damage um, I think this is a an important thing to understand well because uh, it is the thin line between being functional and non-functional and this is the interesting thing that uh, we don't know nowadays uh, how much is functional and how much is not so um, it is quite clear that the the numbers we saw in this in this research, I mean, uh, one thousand above one thousand um, units of uh, creatine kinase, they are not functional because uh, you cannot recover uh, from this stress in just one day or two days. I mean, you need um, more days to recover. So this is not functional at, at all. Uh, you cannot train well during the the post two or three days. So uh, this is a really important question. And I think that uh, what we are seeing is that controlling the metabolic stress is a a good advantage to to optimize recovery and adaptation. And we are controlling metabolic stress uh, not only with, uh, uh, I mean, with ingesting carbohydrates on the the bike, for example, uh, but we are seeing that if you uh, can uh, perform better, I, I don't know if I will be able to explain it well, but I mean, if you are uh, increasing your level of capacity of your work every day, uh, you are doing, you are having greater adaptations that uh, if you are not eating enough energy on the bike, for example. And that muscle damage uh, could be functional as should be, I think, uh, for example, in in um, building new new cells or new uh, structures about muscle, but um, it's quite clear that having more than uh, I don't know exactly the quantity, but having higher uh, muscle damage um, values, they are not functional at all. So uh, this is a thin line between being functional and not functional. But um, I have really um I, yeah really clear that eating on the bike every day uh this um doesn't blunt your your adaptation but in the in the other hand can optimize them yeah from a chronic perspective you're just able to do more quality work more quality training when you are recovering quicker you're better able to do the training uh, perform to your potential day day in day out uh, that, that makes uh, makes sense especially given that we we as you say don't know where is the limit between functional um, and the non-functional yeah. uh, damage to so, summarize I, I would say that you can control better your metabolic stress or your physical stress uh between those functional values i don't know if if uh, you can understand better like this 
Yeah, yeah. And and uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm on the same page as you. Uh, I, I maybe look at it slightly differently, but but I think a key, uh, one key factor that I look at it tends to be like overall work done and actually measured in kilojoules on the bike is, is the the way that I would prefer to measure it. And, and you just can perform a lot more work uh, if you are recovering optimally by making sure that you, you fuel well on the bike. And uh, another question that I have about your research is, so you you compared the race times, obviously, and there was a trend for faster times in the high carbohydrate group, but uh, but only a trend, not uh, statistically significant. Uh, do you what What do you think about that? What What are your comments about the yeah. potential performance gains about higher carbohydrate intake? Yeah, um, we cannot forget that we are on doing science and uh, statistic. They are really important in this process, but. Uh, as you said, the trend was positive for the race time and also the intensity. And although there is not, there were not uh, statistical differences between groups. I think in the reality, almost thirty seconds, twenty seconds, they are quite significant uh, in terms of winning or losing. And uh, we are seeing this every day in the in the TV in the big races. Uh, so yeah, it was not. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, significant in terms of statistic in the in the research, but I think it has an important uh, application in the in the reality. So uh, what we are seeing, I, I would say, quite clear is that um, on performance uh, you can improve quite um, importantly your performance uh, eating more carbohydrates, and especially when you are uh, going full gas on a race uh, and I'm talking about uh, races like Tour de France or Paris Nice or uh, we have seen with higher carbohydrates uh, carbohydrate intakes that we are uh, performing better better and uh, this is a quite obvious thing if not I don't know why is one of the biggest or some of the biggest athletes they are consuming such big uh, carbohydrate intakes all right perfect and uh, we talked about a little bit about this already in terms of where the research might be going. We talked about the potential to investigate the, the mechanisms behind uh, higher carbohydrate intake. But uh, in addition to that, are there some other things around this general topic that you or other research groups are and will be researching or where do you see the field going in the in the next few years? Yeah, um, to be honest, we, we did two researches, but uh, we don't know nothing about uh, the possibilities of, for example, 120 grams per hour. And we need to be humble in this in this sense because uh, there are only two, two researches with this quantity and um, we have to continue researching about this. But I think that we have a lot of possibilities. Uh, first of all, in, in training the gas, the gut methodology, I mean, uh, trying to improve um, carbohydrate intakes and fluid intakes uh, on the bike on, on the exercise not only for optimizes performance and recovery but also the, the the food behavior and this is quite important on the athlete uh, routine the athlete uh, habits and uh, secondly I think there are there are some interesting topics about um, combining some supplements with the capacity to absorb or to tolerate higher amounts of foods. So that could be the the next step in the in the research. And of course, uh, we, we have to continue researching a lot about the, the quantities, the, the that famous ratio, the fructose uh, possibilities. So uh, we have a lot of work to do and <laughs> uh, we won't be bored. <laughs> All right. No, that 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 sounds good. Uh, one one follow up on that. Uh, what when you say there that the impact on the athlete's uh, food behavior? Can you elaborate a bit on what you what you mean with that? Yeah. Um, okay. I like that question because this is one thing that we are seeing quite uh, clear also in the in our athletes. So it is important that uh, the energy availability. Is, 
a problem uh, for for some athletes and also the food behavior the um, behavior they have uh, for the eating pattern for the eating habits and i always say that um, the base for performing well is to be um, to have a healthy habits and to be a, a healthy person first and athlete and what we are seeing now is that they can control better those uh, these regulations about the food intake while they eat uh, more carbohydrates, more food on the bike. And this is an important uh, appreciation because uh, the impact on the hormones, on the um, uh, impact, metabolic impact of eating during exercise or after or before is quite different. And we are trying to develop this with uh, not only with athletes, but also with uh, people with diseases, metabolic disease. And uh, I think this is a quite interesting uh, issue here in, in the, not only in the sport nutrition, but in nutrition and, and metabolism uh, in general. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I, I actually recently did an interview, which hasn't been, I don't know if it will be released by the time that this interview goes out, but uh, another nutritionist in the, in the pro cycling uh, field for one of the World Tour teams, and uh, he said that in terms of one of the biggest mistakes that he sees athletes, athletes make, uh, is simply like overemphasizing the, like, or doing too much, uh, like non fuel training and not really realizing the importance of, fueling on the bike so so it really uh resonates with with what he said as well and and i think it makes all sense uh, the other follow-up there uh, when you mentioned that there are some supplements that might help with the absorption uh probably not something that is hugely uh researched yet from what it sounded like but can you give some uh, just a, a brief uh brief overview of what that what those supplements are and what the potential of those might be yeah um yeah they are we have a lot of ideas. We are trying to develop one of them um, in the next month. And uh, we are preparing a, a research for, for that. And it is about the, the nitrates and the, the relation with the ability to absorb higher uh, rates of glucose, for example, due to the vasodilatation that they, that they uh, do. Uh, but uh, we have a lot of supplements like uh, caffeine as well, or not even for increasing performance of or, or, or oxidation or um, absorption of those uh, carbohydrates, but also for maintaining the gut health. That is a really important uh, topic. So uh, we have a lot of research to do uh, with glutamine, with uh, creatine, with probiotics. So there are a lot of possibilities there because um, sometimes we forget, I don't know why we forget the, the, the base, that is the health. Uh, and for absorbing high uh, sugar quantities, you, you need to have uh, a, a good health of the gut, of the stomach and the intestine. So uh, it's quite important to look for uh, this balance between health and the performance of, uh, of carbohydrate uh, tolerance and absorption. All right. And uh, finally, to, to wrap up the discussion about uh, these studies, what would you say are the practical take-home messages for uh, endurance athletes, triathletes, runners, cyclists? If you would summarize a few take-home messages, what would that be? Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, uh, I think that uh, a stress point of this uh, research was that it was almost full <laughs> practical. I mean, it was really practical. It was done in the real conditions. And um, uh, one important thing for me is that, for example, Asker Jeukendruk, that is the, the big guru for, for us, uh, he congratulated me because, or us, the, the research group, uh, because it was a quite impressive work uh, due to the, the 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 reality of the results and how we we did that. So uh, I think that there are some studies that you cannot um, um, I don't know how to say translated the, the results into the reality the reality. Sorry, but in our research, I think um, yeah, you can do totally. And the message could be that. Um, 
not focusing on 120 grams per hour or whatever, but start training your, your gut, start consuming higher carbohydrates amounts on the bike and less of the bike, for example, I mean, exercise or, or of the exercise and start optimizing your, your ability to tolerate and absorb higher uh, carbohydrates because uh, it can be uh, important not only in the muscle damage, but also in your uh, like quality capacity and neuromuscular function. I mean, the, the physical uh, capacity uh, for for the, the upcoming training days and, of course, the races if you are on a state races, for example. So this will be my um, take-home message to start uh, training little by little the, the tolerance to higher uh, carbohydrate uh, intakes and fluid as well. And now with that focus on the, the bigger quantity, that is, it is always like the, the cool thing. Okay, yeah, now I, I have to go to 120 knot because uh, maybe it's too much or, or for, for a, a guy who start uh, eating or who start uh, training his gut now, but uh, just start little by little and go step by step increasing those uh, quantities you can tolerate and absorb. Yeah, like most other things in training, uh, start where you are now and uh, take one step at a time forward. And, and one additional thing that I want to, to emphasize here is that uh, we mentioned the term on the bike a lot. But actually, uh, let's remember that this study was done in runners in yeah. uh, a mountain, uh, mountain marathon uh, trail running, which is uh, running is notoriously more difficult than cycling to, to consume carbohydrate. And uh, I mean, Personally, I definitely noticed that on the run it's more difficult. But but definitely, even if you're like you're a runner listening to this or a triathlete, and you think that well maybe this works on the bike but not on the run, keep in mind that this study was done in runners, and as you say, they're in the real world. And what you just to clarify that for the listeners that uh, yeah. when we sometimes do lab studies, it might not necessarily work that something works in a lab doesn't mean that when you go out and do a mountain marathon it works but here the actual study the the field was uh, was the the race itself so so that gives it more real world applicability yeah so, absolutely yeah. and uh, this is my my mistake sorry because i always tend to uh, say on the bike but this of course on the exercise eh? running yeah. or uh, you know swimming or, or whatever but this is my <laughs> my own mistake i don't know why i always tend to use uh, on the bike or off the bike yeah yeah uh on a slightly different topic uh, you have written on uh, your website a bit about metabolic flexibility and uh, about specifically the height and the breadth of fat oxidation can you talk a little, little bit more about that topic yeah um okay first of all i have to say that uh, i'm not I, i'm not a, a, an expert on, on this topic and uh, there are some other guys that they are doing uh, big things almost 20 years ago and i'm only seeing now what they did uh, some years ago in in athletes so i'm seeing this on my on my own athletes and now I am realizing some of these things. So, yeah, about the metabolic flexibility, um, what we are seeing is that um, it's important to understand that metabolic flexibility is not only about using one fuel well, uh, but of using the two or yeah, the two main fuels, carbohydrate and fats, as well as you can uh, in the ranges. Uh, intensities yeah in the um in, in the different intensities of, of the exercise so this is a, an important thing to understand that for example uh, low carbohydrate diets or high in fat uh, you can improve a lot your fat oxidation you can improve a lot your capacity to oxidize uh, high rates of fats at moderate intensities but once you start going higher in intensity, uh, probably uh, you won't have the, the, the ability, the capacities to go with uh, higher energy expenditure because your, um, your capacity to use glucose uh, is not well uh, trained. You know? And what we are seeing is that with uh, carbohydrate intakes, you can optimize this and you can show also 
um, a moderate high rates of fat oxidation per minute that they are not um, they are not minimal. I mean, uh, you can uh, oxidize quite big uh, quantities of fat um, at moderate intensities. Of course, they are lower than uh, those athletes who who are not eating carbohydrates, but uh, you can go with a high uh, rate of fat oxidation. And probably this could be because uh, it all depends on the on the mitochondria and the capacity to use uh, substrates and oxidize them. And I think that the the, the main stimulus to to uh, train or to optimize adaptation in the mitochondria is to train well, to train hard, and to train uh, a lot. And for that, it is quite uh, obvious that you need carbohydrates and uh, you need to take care of the of the food you eat on the energy you do you eat on the on the exercise so that's a little bit uh, what we are seeing now what i am seeing with my cyclists or athletes on the f- metabolic flexibility uh, i have started now to measure well this uh, the metabolic flexibility and and i think that um, it's quite important to understand that it's not only one fuel but the both and to be versatile to be uh, flexible using both of them. So uh, this is the the main important issue that uh, I have learned from from start uh, testing. Yeah, yeah. And a link to the article on your blog. It's uh, quite uh, really good and has a, a nice uh, nice chart there. But with the the height and the breadth of the fat oxidation curve, what you're illustrating there in an example is kind of that if you're uh, when, when you're good and uh, when you're you are metabolic flexible and you can use both uh both fuels both carbohydrate and fat your peak fat oxidation may be lower than somebody who is uh purely focusing on on low carbs and and only focusing on fats so uh, but that peak fat oxidation still happens at a relatively low intensity maybe around 60 percent of vo2 max and uh, as the width of the fat oxidation curve there shows that when you go to let's say 75 or 80 percent of vo2 max uh, you might be at close to zero with that low carb approach, but you might still be burning some fat. Uh, in uh, so your curve is wider, even though it's not as high. But the area under the curve might be similar in both cases. But then, if you look at the carb oxidation curve, which isn't shown there, but uh, just uh, just knowing that you reduce your your ability to to utilize carbs, then it, it is obviously very evident that your total amount to use fuel might be better when when you're using both of those fuels efficiently mm. yeah finally it's, it's not only about fat oxidation or carbo- or glucose oxidation but it's about the, the energy you can um, expend the energy you can produce and maybe this post could be better showing the the total energy and not only the fat oxidation but uh, i don't know i decided to do <laughs> this post only just focus on fat oxidation uh, to to visualize that there are um, other uh, methods to increase the fat oxidation, not only going uh, low carb. And um, but yeah, the important thing is the the, the capacity to produce uh, energy uh, with efficiency efficiently. Sorry, with uh, with the, the the two fuels of uh, of exercise. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned there that the the training is uh, the really most important factor there because it's something that I think is often missed. We miss the forest for the trees uh, sometimes with with that, but really the the training is the the number one factor. Yeah, and I totally agree with that because uh, if not, I think we are going uh, in an error. Uh, training is the the most important uh, stimulus for improving. Not only performance, but also the health. With this problem that we have in the we have sorry in the uh, in the population of uh, metabolic diseases and sedentaries, um, I think the the main stimulus, the yeah, the, the most important thing we can do is to start moving, uh, independently of the uh, on the food we 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 ingest or we eat. Uh, but if we start moving, we start um, exercising the probably the, the adaptation in the mitochondria will be uh, greater or better than if we start only doing one nutritional intervention but stay on the on the sofa or uh, on, the, on the chair. So, yeah. yeah, I think it's 
quite an important thing to understand that the, the movement is the, the first uh, stimulus and uh, what we have to do from nutrition is to try to optimi optimize it, not to invent other uh, methods just to um, support as, as best as we can that movement and that training uh, to, to perform better. Yeah, and it's something that I'm sure you've seen on Twitter, but I think Inigo San Milan has uh, done a lot of recent uh, tweets and written a lot about that, just the general health aspects, and but the importance of movement as the, the number yeah. one yeah, yeah. factor really in health. Yeah, so, and, so and that, let me let me say, sorry, that um, this post was inspired in, in Alan Cosen's blog that I read some years ago. And once I started measuring athletes, uh, I realized okay this guy was okay and this is a, a, a an old rocker in this of physiology and of course Inigo Sambian is uh, uh, yeah an inspiration for 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 all us and yeah it's uh, they, they are doing such important things there in, in Colorado yeah so uh, let's uh, start to wrap up here and uh, go into the rapid fire question so take just one sentence uh, to answer each of these and the first one is What's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to endurance sports or nutrition? Okay, it's difficult to answer this question in just 10 seconds, but I would say that um, I will go for the, for the blog. I think for nutrition, my sports science from uh, Aska Geokandrup is one of the best blog in the world, in the topic. And of course, the, the, the blog from Alan Cousins is uh, one of the references for, for us. About the books, uh, to be honest, I, I'm not reading a lot of books about this. I'm more on scientific chapters or uh, scientific um, papers. And and I would say also that uh, although this is not a resource, uh, the best way to improve is the practice. And to improve your knowledge is the practice. And uh, I don't know if my athletes, they are a book, but I will say that because they are full of uh, knowledge and full of uh, new uh, yeah, experiences to to learn about about this uh, physiology and metabolism, nutrition, or training. Yeah. Mm. What's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Uh, I would say that being in contact with the nature, uh, trying to move, <laughs> movement is the most important habit. Uh, to be there out in the in the mountains uh, always. Uh, or at least when I can and to stay with my my best friend that is my dog it's the most important uh, thing that I have in the so controlling my I don't know, I wouldn't say success because I'm in one point of life that I don't think that is success sorry but um, yeah I will say that and finally who's somebody in endurance sports or academia that has uh, inspired you or that you look up to yeah, uh, I would say in that moment, nowadays, probably, yeah, Inigo Samian, uh, probably he's the, the people the, with or a, a true reference for me uh, due to the things he's doing, not only in the uh, research, but only uh, also in the in cycling. So I will say Inigo, yeah. All right, perfect. And finally, where can people find you and the work you're doing on social media, on your website and so on? Yeah, I have a little blog or a little website that um, is called Glut4 Science. Glut4 is the transporter of glucose in the, uh, mainly in the muscle. And in, with the same name, I am in social media, in Twitter, Instagram or Facebook. And on Twitter, I'm like personal like M V Aitor, and you can find me there in the Twitter discussing a lot of things and trying to to learn as much as possible. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and we'll have all of that linked to in the uh, in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much, Aitor. It's been really interesting to hear uh, about your research and uh, also the, the practice, uh, the practical takeaways from it. So really appreciate you taking the time for this. Okay, so thanks for you. It's, it's been a pleasure and just apologize for my English, to be honest, because I don't know if if I have been able to, to express myself well, but I, I hope so. And um, that's it. Thank you. 
Well, I think at least I, I understood everything. So uh, probably the listeners will, will as well. <laughs> yeah, that's it, right. it was good. All right. Thanks. I hope that you enjoyed that interview. As always, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com with links to ITOR's website and social media and also links to all nutrition-related episodes that we have had on that triathlon show and, of course, the specific papers that came out of the study in the mountain marathon runners that we discussed throughout this episode. On Thursday, we have another Q&A coming out, and next Monday, I interview Richard Ferguson from Loughborough University, who joins us to discuss blood flow-restricted training in endurance sports, which is a very interesting topic. If you are looking for training plans or coaching services, go and check out scientifictriathlon.com. This is, as it being early in the year, a great time to consider starting to work with a professional coach or a training plan to help you achieve your goals for 2021, whether they be racing or other epic challenges that you may have set your, for yourself. Big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Go and take their free online sweat test to get a personalized hydration strategy and get 15% off your order with the promo code thattriathlonshow15. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Check out their wetsuits, dry suits, swim skins, goggles, high-performance eyewear and prescription glasses and sunglasses and get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can get on roka.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving craft love.